Today's video is by popular request about the recent court case decision about ring doorbells. The trial was actually on the 6th and 7th of May of this year, 2021, but the judgment was handed down on the 12th of October. Many people watching will be wondering, do you now have to go out and remove your ring doorbell or nest doorbell or any other kind of doorbell that captures video and audio? The short answer is no, you don't need to rush out and remove them all, but the long answer, as always, is much more complicated. The judgment was 50 pages long. I'm going to give you the broad summary and some broad guidelines if you want to think about your own doorbell. But of course, you must always seek formal legal advice. This video can only serve as guidance and my summary and interpretation of the judgment. But first of all, if you're new to me, I'm a barrister who helps you understand law on this channel, so please hit the subscribe button and the bell icon so you don't miss out on future videos. And check out my courses on blackbeltbarrister.com. So the brief outline of the case is that the claimant brought a claim in nuisance, breach of data protection and harassment from the use of several security cameras and floodlights. The claimant and the defendant were neighbours and there was a car park to the rear of the properties with a road leading to that car park. The defendant said he was concerned about the security of his car, so had set up various security cameras and floodlights so that he could monitor the activity and report it to the police. There were several cameras and lights that the court describes in its judgment in this case, which you can find at paragraph five of the judgment. Briefly, the defendant kept a shed in the rear of his garden up against the fence and mounted a floodlight and a sensor, which the court refers to as the floodlight, on said shed. Secondly, on the shed, the defendant also mounted a ring spotlight camera, which the court describes as the shed camera, pointing in the direction of the car park. Next to his front door, the defendant also mounted another ring doorbell, which the court refers to as the ring doorbell. Further on the gable end wall, the defendant also mounted another ring spotlight camera, which the court refers to as the driveway camera. This was pointing down the driveway towards the car park. The defendant had also mounted a nest camera on his front window sill, which the court refers to as the windowsill camera. This was essentially pointing out of the window onto the street area. The issues between the parties include several that I've talked about here on this channel, both in my live streams and on various videos. The first issue between the parties was the depth and field of view of these cameras. In other words, to what extent that the cameras could see and capture footage beyond the defendant's property and effectively monitor areas outside of that property, including the claimants and other people's coming and goings, and of course, whether it could hear those conversations. That was the second issue, the sensitivity of the microphones. The third issue was to its automatic activation when it noticed some movement. The fourth issue, which is one that I'm going to talk about quite a bit in this video, is the extent that the defendant undertook to discuss with the neighbors the fact that he was putting up these cameras before installing them and what they would capture. Fifth and finally, how and for what purposes the defendant was going to store such video and audio recordings. That comes in with data protection, which again I'm going to talk about to a reasonable extent in this video. Arising from these issues and taken together, the claimant brought a claim in three separate areas of law. Firstly, in nuisance, briefly speaking, that the claimant said it was a nuisance that the cameras were overlooking her property, and it was a nuisance that the lights kept coming on, which also shone over her property. Secondly, that the defendant had breached the Data Protection Act 2018 and the relevant regulations. This will respectfully serve as a bit of a warning to viewers of this channel that argue that the Data Protection Act doesn't apply to home CCTV, and you will find out why if you watch to the end of the video. Third but not least was a claim for harassment, where the claimant said that the course of conduct undertaken by the defendant amounted to harassment in respect of not just the cameras and the lights, but the way in which the defendant had acted toward the claimant and other parties. The brief summary is that the claimant's claims in Harassment and Breach of Data Protection Act both succeeded, whereas the claimant's claims in Nuisance failed. And what I'm going to do in this video, instead of go through the entirety of the judgment, which I will link below and you can read at your leisure, it's about 50 pages long, I'm going to summarize in this video the main reasons for this judgment and what you should really take into account if you are installing ring doorbells and the steps that you might like to take to avoid being in a similar scenario. And I'm going to do that first of all by talking about some overarching principles that should apply to neighboring properties and neighbors in a communal area, especially when installing things such as video surveillance, which is going to monitor various parts of your property, 
and potentially capture areas outside of your property. One such fundamental point that you should take away from this judgment is that neighbours should be open and transparent with each other and discuss with each other before installing a video camera that is going to capture anything that is outside of your property at all. And that includes the audio. Because if you are in properties that are very close together, such as the ones in the judgment, they were terraced properties, there is a real possibility that the audio is going to capture conversations of neighbors in their garden. But particularly if your camera is going to capture any video footage whatsoever that is outside of the boundaries of your property, my first suggestion to you would be to discuss it with your neighbors first. If your neighbours agree to it and they don't have an objection to you having the camera there, that is much less likely to be a problem moving forward. I might even suggest doing that by email so that you have a record of the conversation so that if later that decision changes, then at least you have an original copy of the correspondence whereby your neighbours agreed to the camera being there in the first place. And the second principle is be absolutely honest and transparent with your neighbours because in this judgment, the defendant was held by the court to have lied about several installations, saying that they were dummy cameras or that they were not recording, which the court didn't accept and found those to be untrue. Those went to support the claims in harassment, which I will come back to in a moment. So if indeed you are putting up cameras, be honest with your neighbor that they are cameras rather than dummy cameras, because that is not going to serve you later on. You cannot just say that they weren't recording when in fact they probably were on the balance of probabilities and ultimately that is going to damage the credibility of all of your evidence. The third thing that I would say to you is that if there is a legitimate reason for you using the cameras, such as watching your cars, as was alleged in this case for criminal activity, don't then take that to the extent that you are threatening your neighbours to report footage to the police of them being anywhere near your vehicle or things like that. Merely making threats to your neighbours that you are sending the footage to the police when in fact you didn't, which was the case found by the court in this judgment, they are likely to help to form the basis of a harassment claim such as in this case here. In this judgment at paragraph 73, the court said, I am satisfied on the balance of probabilities that he did not send it to the police because he knew that it was the claimant and that she posed no threat to him. The claimant's evidence is that she perceived this message and the images sent to her to be a form of intimidation. Paragraph 73 goes on to say that she, the claimant, said that she considered he was warning her not to ask him or otherwise pursue her concerns about his surveillance activity and threatening to misuse the images that he was capturing of her going to and from her house. The defendant accepted in oral evidence that he had sent those images of the claimant to some of the neighbors with a message saying, this is the most recent suspicious activity. So it seems that her concerns about the misuse of the images were well founded. It was put to him, the defendant, that he had told the claimant that he had sent her image to the police to intimidate her because he was angry that she told him that she found his cameras intrusive. He denied it, but I am satisfied that it is more likely than not that this was the case. In other words, the defendant had shared the claimant's images with other neighbors and said that he'd sent it to the police in order to intimidate her. That was the case put to the court and the court accepted that that was the case. So now moving to summarize the claims in the case and whether or not they were made out. And you can find this under the application of law to the facts section, beginning at paragraph 125 of the judgment. In making its finding, the court looked at the acts of the defendant and explains at paragraph 126, that the question was whether taken together all of those acts without separating them out into individual acts, all of them taken together amounted to harassment for the purposes of the Protection from Harassment Act 1997. And in deciding whether or not such a claim was made out, the court looked at the following things. First of all, whether the defendant engaged in a course of conduct, because that is required for a claim of harassment to be made out. And the court quite rightly said that there was no doubt about this because the course of conduct was on at least two occasions which the court had found in this case. Secondly, whether the course of conduct amounted to harassment. And the court explained that it found on several occasions the defendant had caused the claimant alarm and distress, which although it wasn't necessary, it was within the concept of harassment. In other words, if you are causing somebody alarm and distress, it is within that same general concept of harassment, even though it is not specifically a requirement. The court explained that this included when the defendant had falsely told her that he'd sent these images to the police. 
This obviously caused her alarm and distress because she felt that those being reported to the police might well get her into trouble and obviously that caused her upset. And accordingly, the court accepted that that could be perceived by the claimant as intimidation. Secondly, there was a phone call in 2019 where the defendant was deliberately trying to scare the claimant. There was a threat by text message. There was a lie that images had been sent to the police. There was another phone call in which the defendant had threatened to set up additional cameras including concealed cameras, which left the claimant alarmed and shaken to the extent that she had to leave the home. And taken together, the court concluded that this behaviour went beyond what was just unattractive or unreasonable to that which was oppressive and unacceptable. So this was a boundary that the court was considering when looking at the behaviour. The court went on to consider whether the defendant knew or ought to have known that this conduct amounted to harassment. And the test there and the question therefore is whether a reasonable person who had the same knowledge of the facts of what was going on would have thought that this behaviour amounted to harassment. And the court concluded and was satisfied that any reasonable person would consider that this level of dishonesty, threats and oppressive behaviour would amount to harassment. Finally, the court went on to consider whether or not the conduct was not harassment because it was for the purposes of preventing or detecting crime, or in the particular circumstances, whether or not it was reasonable. And this is where defence counsel focused his primary arguments and submitted that the cameras were installed in essence to detect crime and protect the defendant's property and vehicle. But defence counsel went on to submit that the claimant had no understanding or compassion for the defendant and why he took such actions with the cameras. And also that the defendant's actions were reasonable in the circumstances of the case and that the claimant was being unduly sensitive. The court was not impressed and strongly disagreed with the defence counsel's arguments and for those reasons the claim in harassment succeeded against the defendant. The claims in nuisance, which I will summarise very briefly because they failed, in essence involved overlooking of another property and the floodlights coming on illuminating the claimant's property. In short, there was an authority put to the court, it was a court of appeal decision, that said merely overlooking another property wouldn't amount to nuisance and the court also felt that the shining of light on the property didn't amount to nuisance because the claimant lived in a built-up area, uh, not in the countryside, and therefore did not find that it was undue interference with her enjoyment and use of the property, which is sort of a requirement for nuisance. Neither did it affect the value of the property, nor was it reasonably foreseeable to the defendant that the claimant would leave the property and live elsewhere because of this situation. So ultimately the claims in nuisance therefore failed. Data protection is the next big area that this case looked at and many viewers of this channel have said that these laws don't apply to home CCTV. I've always said that that's not the case because data protection will be engaged if your cameras are capturing areas outside of your property or even to the extent that someone is walking by. Whilst it's not mandatory to register with the ICO, of course you can, but the data protection principles will apply and claims for breach as you can see in this case, can be made out. To that extent, you can see from paragraph 134 of the judgment that the court found that because the defendant was collecting data, in other words, video footage and audio footage, from outside the boundaries of his property, particularly by the driveway camera, but also in respect of the other cameras, it was therefore for him to satisfy the court that the processing of that data was, I quote, necessary for the purposes of the legitimate interests of the controller, the defendant being a data controller in this case, except where such interests are overridden by the interests or fundamental rights and freedoms of the data subject. The defendant of course submitted that the collection and processing was necessary because he was trying to prevent crime to his property and vehicle in the car park. Ultimately, in respect of the ring doorbell, the court found that the balance was met between the legitimate interests of the defendant to collect the data outside of his property, that being the security, against the claimant's right to privacy. That's because the claimant was only likely to be captured incidentally as she walked past or if she approached the doorbell, in which case it was still a legitimate interest of the defendant to protect his home. Much as is anyone coming to your home ringing the doorbell, it is a legitimate interest in protecting the home for someone that comes up to your front door. However, the audio recording the court did have more of an issue with and addressed it further on in the judgment. However, the driveway camera posed much more of a difficulty because this only collected data 
from outside of the defendant's property. You will have heard me say many times on this channel that if you have a camera that is pointed outside of your property, and certainly if most of it is only capturing footage from outside of your property, there will be issues in respect of data protection. And so it seems the court agrees with me. Accordingly, in respect of the driveway camera, the court found that the defendant's processing of the claimant's personal data was not lawful. As I said, the court returned to the issue of audio recording as personal data of both the shed camera, the driveway camera, and the ring doorbell. And the court refreshed the principle that personal data collection should be, and I quote, adequate, relevant, and limited to what is necessary in relation to the purposes for which they are processed. And then the court explored the principle that the purpose of the CCTV was to essentially watch what's going on for security purposes, but didn't necessarily need to listen to it, as is the case with many of the CCTV around the country that doesn't use audio recording. And ultimately that much of the legitimate aim for which those cameras are used did not need to use the audio recording, and therefore found that the audio recordings collected by the defendant was not lawful. And for all those reasons, the court found that the claimant's claims that the defendant had breached the provisions of the Data Protection Act and UK GDPR was successful. And accordingly, she was entitled to compensation and orders to prevent the continuing breach of her rights moving forward. So you can see from that broad outline of the case that there are several different aspects that all come together. Leaving aside nuisance, which I might well address in another video, nuisance will generally arise if there is something continuing that is more than you should expect to bear and there's reasonable foreseeability of loss, such as a leaky pipe that is continually flooding or damaging someone's property, but I'll come back to that in another video. But for the purposes of this case, the claims in harassment and breach of data protection were made out. Because of the way the cameras were used, because of the amount of data that was collected, but also, which is why I started with this point, fundamentally the behaviour of the parties and the conversations and the threats that were made, the dishonesty in the case, and essentially behaviour that went beyond unattractive and unreasonable to the extent that it was oppressive and simply unacceptable. That being a course of conduct that amounted to harassment, and in respect of the data protection, it was more than what was necessary in that the defendant's cameras were capturing images entirely outside of his property and audio that was far beyond the scope that was necessary for the legitimate purpose. So what do we take away from this? So if you have a ring doorbell or CCTV at your property, you don't need to go and take it down straight away before you've considered all of these things and dare I say it again, take formal legal advice. But the broad position is this, and mirrors what I've said in many of my live streams and previous videos. If your CCTV or your ring doorbell or any other device that captures video or audio material, be very careful to check the scope and field of view of both the camera in its video recording capacity and in the audio capacity that it captures because if it captures conversations in your neighbor's garden, then that is going beyond the scope of what is legitimately necessary to protect the security of your home. For example, if the field of view just about captures movement from your neighbor and therefore starts recording and is recording their conversations when they are in their garden, whilst that might not necessarily amount to nuisance, it would very likely, following this judgment, amount to a breach of data protection because the audio recording is beyond what is necessary to protect your property. But let's say that you have an area that is not your property, let's say it's a communal car park or a communal area that other people share, and their comings and goings are going to be captured by any camera on that area. The only thing that I can say to you is you should ensure that absolutely everybody that is living in that area that is likely to be coming and going have not only been told about it, but agree with the fact that there's a camera watching the area. This might well be part of a neighborhood watch scheme where everybody's signed up to it, everybody knows that it's being recorded and nobody objects to it. If in the event that you get even one person who shares that communal area and it's not your property, but it's being captured nonetheless, 
and their comings and goings are going to be recorded in that area and they strongly object, then following this judgment, they may well have a claim against you for breach of data protection and depending on how you interact with them, potentially harassment as well. So the bottom line and kind of where I started is be open and transparent with all of your neighbors. Don't record anything that is more than is necessary because data protection laws certainly do apply to your own premises if you are capturing footage that is beyond the scope. But as I said, there is no automatic need to panic and take down the doorbell without first checking all of the things that I've said. And of course, once again, seeking formal legal advice before you do anything. And as a final warning to those that have looked at the judgment, please don't just issue claims in court without talking to your neighbor first and without bringing it up for discussion and without following pre-action protocols. Not only is this going to clog up the court system, but it may put you at risk to costs that may be totally unnecessary if it is a totally unfounded claim. So if you're in that position and you're thinking of doing so, please do seek formal legal advice to limit the risk of adverse costs against you. So with that, I apologize for the length of the video, but please give it a thumbs up if you like this dissection of judgments. And remember, stay humble and subscribe.